Let us worship God. Let us draw nigh to the Lord in singing praise to him from Psalm 136. We'll sing from the second version of Psalm 136, verses 1 to 6, to the tune Crofts 136, which is tune number 185. Praise God, for he is kind, his mercy lasts for a. Give thanks with heart and mind to God of God always. For certainly his mercies dure, most firm and sure eternally. Let's sing together verses 1 to 6. face together in prayer. Our Father of mercies and God of all comfort, we do rejoice that your mercies endure forever. How thankful we are that we have copious evidence that you do not change and that the mercies promised 
and experienced already will be confirmed and repeated and multiplied in the days that follow. And so we would lean heavy upon you, our, our great God. Uh, you are the rock upon whom we stand. And you have made your son, the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, to be the chief cornerstone, elect and precious. We acknowledge, O oh Lord, that he is precious to all who believe, though a stone of stumbling to those who walk in unbelief. Uh, grant that we would fall upon him and be broken by the gospel and deliver us, O Lord, uh, that he might not fall upon us, uh, whereby we would be crushed and destroyed. We rejoice that you have made a promise with your servant Abraham that in him all the families of the earth would be blessed and that you would bless those who bless them. And you have extended that promise to us. We, O oh Lord, are the seed of Abraham, though not after the flesh, yet children by promise, and heirs of all that was his and now is ours. And we are thankful that you bless those who bless the cause of Zion and curse those who curse the cause of Zion, that your people remain the apple of your eye, and that you must say to many, as you did to Saul, why persecutest thou me? We acknowledge, O Lord, that, that you have taken a special provision for your people to bring them under the shelter of your wing, to gather them as chicks, to shield and protect them from all harm. We rejoice, O Lord, to be safe in the Lord Jesus Christ, to be hid uh, to be kept, to be defended. You are a God who uh, is aroused and who is both able and determined to destroy all that raises itself against Christ and his people. We ask, O oh God, that you would give us then help to, uh, to continue to be still and know that you are God, that you will be exalted in all of the earth. And we ask that you would hasten that day, O Lord, when the, as we read this morning, when the knowledge of the glory of the Lord will cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. It would be more than we could hope for had you not promised. But having promised it, O Lord, we are as a certain of the truthfulness of it than we are of anything in all the world. We would, O Lord, depend upon that word and ask that you would Remember uh, what you have said, that you would bring it forth according to your will, and your own good pleasure, and your own time, but that you would hasten, O Lord, the day of uh, the fulfillment of all of these things, when, when Zion will be exalted above all the mountains of the earth, and when the nations will flow unto it, to be taught of the Lord, to be taught of Zion, when even the Gentile kings will serve as nursing fathers and nursing mothers, uh, to your your people. Uh, we, O oh Lord, ask for the spread of this uh, gospel and for with it the spread of the glory of Christ and the ingathering of the elect and the bringing in of those who would worship you in spirit and in truth. We desire for every tongue, language, not just English, uh, not just the, the languages with which we're most familiar, but for every tribe and tongue, uh, to employ uh, their mouths and to utilize the vocabulary of their language in extolling our great and gracious God. So, Lord, bring blessing down upon uh, your cause, revive it, cause it to f your blessing to fall like the dew upon the fresh mown grass, that the tender herb and all of the fruitfulness which you have ordained would come forth in great measure. Uh, bless, we ask, uh, the ministry of your word to us. Help us to attend unto this uh, word with preparation and with diligence and prayer, uh, to receive it with faith and love, to lay it up in our hearts and to practice it in our lives. May this be true of us, O God, that we would be a people of the book, a people who know 
the voice of the shepherd and who follow it, a people who live by your word, who know the times and who do great exploits under your hand. We pray for our families, that you would bless marriages with uh, unity and mutual love and forbearance, and that you would give to husbands and wives to be uh, delivered from selfishness and and uh, all of the sins which are the tendency of the natural heart, that wives would submit to their husbands, not in word but in deed, that husbands would love their wives sacrificially, not merely in word but deed, that parents would not exacerbate, exasperate their, their children, frustrating them, but would rather raise them in the, the fear and admonition of the Lord, teaching them and training them in the way they should go, Grant that children would be wise, that they would uh, profit and appreciate for the, the instruction and all of the provisions that are made for them, and that they would, uh, that they would utilize and harness it and, and uh, would know your blessing upon it to the everlasting good of their souls. We ask that you would raise up, O Lord, in the generations to come, children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren and great-great-grandchildren, uh, who would, uh, you would preserve for yourself. Uh, that who would call upon the name of the Lord and who would serve you in, in, in sincerity and in truth. We ask that you would fortify and strengthen your people in an evil day, that we would not be prone to the uh, mentality and way of the world, but that we would live as those who belong to the Lord, uh, tearing down and demolishing and shredding, as it were, every... every uh, idea, every stronghold, every notion which is raised against the obedience of the Lord Jesus Christ, that all of these things would be brought captive uh, to Christ as Lord. Uh, grant that our minds would be transformed, uh, not conformed to the pattern of this world, but transformed by the, the renewing of our minds in your word. Uh, grant, O Lord, that you would forgive us for all of our sins, but especially our sins in holy things. Uh, even the best of our devotions are tainted with sin, at least, if not more. We confess, O oh God, our need for the forgiveness of sins. Forgive us for our inadequate prayer, for our uh, inability and shortcomings and sin and singing your praise and, and handling your word. Uh, grant, Lord, that you would forgive us for uh, our many sins, that not having earnestness or God consciousness in our service before you. Forgive and cleanse us, we ask, for Jesus' sake. Uh, bless, we, we pray, the, uh, the ongoing work of your kingdom in, in our midst, especially that which is near to us. We pray again, as we did this morning, for the work ahead this week in our General Assembly. Grant the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Grant that uh, there would be bonds that would be formed with other churches and expressions of uh, biblical and principled unity. Uh, bless the preaching, O Lord, which will take place, that it might come with power and great fruitfulness to those who hear. Uh, bless uh, those assembled for prayer. Lord, look upon those seasons of prayer in which uh, time is given for ministers and elders to uh, seek your face on behalf of our church. Hear their cry, we ask, and grant that you would answer abundantly. We commend all these things into your care. Bless those in our own midst, broken down with struggles with sin and physical affliction and emotional, uh, emotional exhaustions and all of the spiritual toil. Uh, lift up and strengthen the hearts of your people. Raise up their heads and strengthen the feeble knees. And brace them and grant that you would embolden the hearts of those who are faint and that you would encourage and enliven those who, who, uh, who are lacking. And we pray, O oh God, that all that is needed would be provided above and beyond all that we could ask or imagine. Bless, we ask the cause of Christ and the preaching of the gospel uh, in our streets on Fridays and track distribution and on other occasions, the witness borne by your people to their neighbors and colleagues and family members. Uh, Lord, look with mercy and take all of our, our small uh, pittance of effort and 
in raising uh, a banner for Christ and cause it, O oh Lord, to, uh, to, to bring forth fruit in the ingathering of many souls to your praise. Help us, we ask, as we continue to worship you in spirit and in truth this afternoon. Give us a mind to seek the Lord with all of our hearts, and may we find you, and in finding you, find much blessing. We ask for Jesus' sake. Amen. Continue to sing together in Psalm 107, verses 26. 34. The tune is Paisley, which is number 97. Psalm 107, verses 26 to 34. This provides something of a, a backdrop for one of the events that are described for us in the Gospels. You'll remember Jesus with his disciples uh, out on the sea. A storm is raised, a great tempest. Uh, these seasoned and professional fishermen are caused to great fear, cry out for deliverance. And the Lord stands in the boat and says, Peace be still, and calms the wind and the waves which grow silent before him. Well, all of that and more is depicted here in the portion that we're about to sing together. Let's sing Psalm 107, verses 26 to 34.
Our Old Testament reading is found in Isaiah chapter 52. Isaiah chapter 52. Beginning at verse 1. Awake, awake, put on thy strength, O Zion. Put on thy beautiful garments, O Jerusalem, the holy city. For henceforth there shall no more come into thee the uncircumcised and the unclean. Shake thyself from the dust, arise and sit down, O Jerusalem. Loose thyself from the bands of thy neck. O captive daughter of Zion. For thus saith the Lord, ye have sold yourselves for naught. Ye shall be redeemed without money. For thus saith the Lord God, my people went down aforetime into Egypt to sojourn there, and the Assyrian oppressed them without cause. Now therefore, what have I here, saith the Lord, that my people is taken away for naught? They that rule over them make them to howl, saith the Lord, and my name, continu- my name continually every day is blasphemed. Therefore my people shall know my name, therefore they shall know in that day that I am he that doth speak. Behold, it is I. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him that bringeth good tidings that publish peace, that bringeth good tidings of good, that publish salvation, that saith unto Zion, Thy God reigneth. Thy watchmen shall lift up the voice, with the voice together shall they sing, for they shall see eye to eye when the Lord shall bring again Zion. Break forth into joy, sing together, Ye waste places of Jerusalem, for the Lord hath comforted his people. He hath redeemed Jerusalem. The Lord hath made bare his holy arm in the eyes of all the nations, and all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our God. Depart ye, depart ye, go ye out from thence, touch no unclean thing. Go ye out of the midst of her, be ye clean that bear the vessels of the Lord. For ye shall not go out with haste, nor go by flight, for the Lord will go before you, and the Lord and the God of Israel will be your reward. Behold, my servant shall deal prudently. He shall be exalted and extolled and be very high. As many were astonished at thee, his visage was so marred more than any man, and his form more than the sons of men so shall he sprinkle many nations. The kings shall shut their mouths at him, for that which had not been told them shall they see, and that which they had not heard shall they consider. Amen. And may God bless the reading of his holy word. Continue to sing in God's praise. We'll sing the remainder of Psalm 107. Beginning at verse 35, we'll sing through to the conclusion of the psalm at verse 43. The tune is St. Matthew, which is tune number 157. Tune 157. We've had this refrain that has popped up throughout the psalm. Oh, that men to the Lord would give praise for his goodness then and for his works of wonder done unto the sons of men. So we've heard that as we've been singing it together. And then notice the connection with the conclusion of the psalm and thinking of all of the display of God's works that have been laid out before us in these, in these words. It concludes with verse 43, Whoso is wise and will these things observe and then record, even they shall understand the love and kindness of the Lord. Let's sing verses 35 to the end.
read together in God's Word from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 28. Reading together in God's holy word from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 28, beginning at verse 1. In the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulcher. Behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. His countenance was like lightning, and his raiment white as snow. And for fear of him, the keepers did shake and became as dead men. And the angel answered and said unto the women, Fear not ye, for I know that ye seek Jesus, which was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen, as he said. Come, see the place where the Lord lay. And go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. And behold, he goeth before you into Galilee. There shall ye see him. Lo, I have told you. And they departed quickly from the sepulcher with fear and great joy. And did run to bring his disciples word. And as they went to tell his disciples, behold, Jesus met them, saying, All hail. They came and held him by the feet, and worshipped him. Then said Jesus unto them, Be not afraid. Go tell my brethren that they go into Galilee, and there shall they see me. Now when they were going, behold, some of the watch came into the city and showed unto the chief priests all the things that were done. And when they were assembled with the elders and had taken counsel, They gave large money unto the soldiers, saying, Say ye, his disciples came by night and stole him away while we slept. And if this come to the governor's ears, we will persuade him and secure you. So they took the money and did as they were taught. And this saying is commonly reported among the Jews until this day. Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee, into a mountain where Jesus had appointed them, and when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. Our text this afternoon is found in Matthew chapter 28 and verse 19. Matthew 28, verse 19. We'll read together verses 19 and 20, some of which... Some of the parts of these two verses we've considered on other occasions, but this afternoon, with the Lord's help, we'll be focusing especially on the beginning of verse 19, Go ye therefore and teach all nations. So it reads, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. These words we commonly refer to as the Great Commission, the commission that Christ gave to his church to take the gospel to the ends of the world. And this commission, rather than being on the periphery, is central to the identity and life of the church. So we can't think in terms of the church being primarily you know, a a collection of of things. And then we have this great commission, and it is also part of the package way down the list or on the outer reaches or the fringe of of what uh, the church is to be. No, quite to the contrary. As you see in this first 
gospel in the New Testament, the whole gospel ends on these words. It's punctuated, it's emphasized, underlined by the position that it's given. It's similar words are repeated in Acts 1, so that some of the last words spoken to the disciples prior to the ascension of the Lord Jesus Christ has to do with this great commission, with taking the good news of the gospel to all nations, all peoples, throughout the length and breadth of the world. This is central to the identity of the church. Now, I emphasize that because to the degree that the church allows this to slip, to the degree that the church allows this to be pushed down into an ancillary or secondary position, to that degree, the church is departing from the biblical model that God has given to us. It is front and center. It is central uh, to who we are and to what God has, has called us to do. Now, missions itself, of course, is not the end. It is a means to the end. The end is the worship of God. That's the main thing. That's the chief thing. And the work of missions and evangelism and the spread of the gospel is the God-appointed means to the end of bringing men and women, nations, and people groups to worship the God of heaven. I say that because God is the one who is ultimate, not man. And so the end can never be something that pertains to man, per se, but to God himself. And is the worship and spread of God's own glory. And the emphasis in this passage is that they are to go and to teach all nations. So all nations, that is to say all people groups, not just not just the political entities that we think of as countries, though that's included, but people groups which change and there's fluctuation in terms of the borders and boundaries of, of, uh, of various countries. But it's the gospel is being taken throughout the whole world, every tribe and tongue. And so the glory of God is very much connected to what we call the Great Commission. The spread of God's glory, the ingathering of those who will worship and adore God is very much connected to the Great Commission. When we look into the heavens in the, the latter days, what do we see in the book of Revelation? But that people from every tribe and tongue and all sorts of folk from all different places in the earth are there present in heaven before the throne, worshiping the lamb who was slain and giving him glory. This emphasis is not peculiar to the New Testament. I said this morning that whereas the Old Testament was primarily a come and see religion and the New Testament is a go and tell religion, that, that's true, but it's not as if in the Old Testament there was no notion of the gospel being taken to the ends of the world. Quite to the contrary, God comes to our patriarch Abraham and says, through you all the families of the earth will be blessed so that his eyes were set not just on that geographical portion of real estate in Palestine, the promised land, but far beyond that, to the whole world. And that's why throughout the prophets, we have all of these references to the light being taken to the Gentiles and the spread of the gospel to the kings of, of the nations of the earth. That's why even in the Old Testament, we have the gospel going to places like Nineveh, the capital of Assyria, an arch enemy of Israel, and revival breaking out and the king owning the true religion and implementing it into his, into his, uh, among his people and many other examples uh, like that. The horizon has always been the whole earth. And so we come to the New Testament and there's a, there's a whole other dimension, an emphasis, an equipment, and focus that's given. But it is very much rooted in the beginning. God's intention and purpose to save a people for himself throughout the whole world. And so we're focusing this afternoon on what we call the Great Commission. I want you to notice three things with regards to this Great Commission. It's, it's not just a commission. It is a great command, and it requires a great commitment as well as being a great commission. And so first of all, it is a great command. Jesus says, go, go ye therefore, 
and teach all nations. There is lost mankind which can only be met with Christ's power to save. And these two things must go together. It is a command that God has given. It is not something you can take or leave. It is not something you can embrace or allow to sit on the shelf. It is a divine command that belongs to the church in every age and to thus extends to all Christians in all places. Notice that the Great Commission is not just the foundation for foreign missions. I think this is an important point. It is the foundation for preaching at all. It's the foundation for preaching at all. You know, we have those who are called into the gospel ministry and who settle here in the United States and have the comforts that come with that and so on. But the only valid authority for preaching in the United States is this commission, this command, which is to say only because the United States of America is one of the, quote, all nations in this text that is specified in this text, in this commission, do we have authority to be preaching in the United States? See, we tend to think in our... our uh, American-centered world, that we are the ones who have the gospel and that the gospel is to be taken elsewhere to the ends of the earth. But remember that America itself dwelled in darkness, that when this commission was given, the gospel was leaving Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and making its way into Europe at the time. It was a long ways before reaching the shores of our country. We're the ones on the outside. We're the recipients, if you will, of, of the Great Commission. And so I think it's essential for us to realize that this is not only a foundation for foreign missions, but for preaching at all. The implication is this, if that's so, and it is, how come most of the laborers cluster together in one little corner of the vineyard? Why is that? that most of the laborers cluster together in one little corner of the vineyard. So when you, you look at graduation from seminaries in the United States of America, what proportion or percentage of those are going to foreign fields? It's relatively small. Pretty insignificant most of the time. Which means that there is an unequal distribution of laborers, and at least to some degree, a monopoly that we see. Part of this is because we're fettered by our parochialism, our own prejudice and sense of importance and significance as a nation, our own desire for what's comfortable and for what we are familiar with, and so on, partly because we're xenophobic. You know, we, we, we know our people and our country and are very uncomfortable, perhaps, with other people and, and other countries. But you take for an illustration, let's say, and this is merely an illustration, God had commanded that the gospel be taken to the United States of America and that all of America was to be taught uh, the gospel. Let's say that's, that was the commission, is that the gospel is to be taken only to the United States of America. What if all of the laborers gathered together in Lawrence County, South Carolina? And that's where they all were residing. And there was very little effort to evangelize the rest of the United States of America, not just South Carolina, but all of the other 50 states. And it was left to two or three worn out preachers uh, to carry out that task. We would think this is rather peculiar. And yet this does tend to be a tendency in our, our thinking, at least in our thinking, the way that we approach uh, the Great Commission. But my friends, it is a command that the gospel is to be taken to the entire world. And the only reason I am here preaching in Greenville, South Carolina this afternoon is because of this commission. And it applies to us 
as well as to the rest of, of the world. This is a command, and therefore God places it central. For the Christian to be a Christian, we are thinking in terms of the priority of taking Christ crucified to every creature under heaven. That's what makes the Christian tick. That's part of, that's part of the way we function in the world, is with that sort of cosmic perspective and emphasis. The Christian comes and sees the value of a single soul, which once brought into existence will continue in existence for all of eternity. It is immortal. It can't be killed. We see the value of that of the soul. We see the power of the Holy Spirit to do what is supernatural and heavenly, the miracle of bringing people to Christ, who could never come to Christ if left on their own. We think of the doctrine of election, that God has has purchased a people for himself whom he's chosen from all the, 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 the peoples of the earth and whom he will with certainty bring to a saving knowledge of himself. And we think the gospel is therefore irresistible and it is undefeatable. And therefore, as the gospel goes forth, it will and must definitively accomplish the purposes for which God has sent it in bringing sinners, God's elect people, unto himself. We think of the mediatorial reign of the Lord Jesus Christ. He is seated, exalted, ascended in heaven at the right hand of the majesty on high as the great king of all the nations. And he is ruling and reigning for his own glory and the spread of his own fame throughout the nations. And so this is a great command. It is a great command. It is indispensable. It is something that cannot be ignored. It is something that must be central. So that we as a congregation, to the degree that we desire to be apostolic and biblical and following the Holy Scripture, to, to that degree, we place a priority on the taking of the gospel to the ends of the earth. We are in dead earnest about it. We are in great interest about its success very much detached to who we are. And that brings us, secondly, to a great commitment, therefore. It's a great command, which leads, then, to a great commitment, a great commitment on our part. How often have I heard, you know, in speaking to someone, that they become a Christian, and they say, you know, I never was interested in reading until I became a Christian. And then all of a sudden, I'm, I, I'm interested in reading stuff. I'm hungry. I want to learn. I want to grow. I want to know more and more about the Lord and all there is about uh, that there is to learn about his truth. Or they say, you know, I, I thought history was the most boring stuff in all the world until I became a Christian. And now I realize it's our story. It's, it's what God's doing in the unfolding of his plan. And, and therefore, it has all sorts of new meaning and it's come alive to me. And I am finding great interest in the, the history of the church and the history of the world and so on. Well, likewise, it ought to be the case for people and saying, you know what, it was, after I became a Christian, I gained, all of a sudden, a keen interest in other countries. You know, I was very happy to be born and raised, you know, in the backwoods of wherever, here in the United States, and had my people, my culture, my history, all the things I knew, but all of a sudden, my horizons were widened, and I became really keenly interested in, in other countries and started trying to figure out the geography and wanted to learn more about the needs of the people and, you know, the culture and the food they eat and what, you know, makes them tick and so on and so forth. It ought to be the case. The Christian has to have an interest because our whole task is to see the gospel taken to all the nations of, of the world. You see, to be a Christian is to be a citizen of a kingdom that extends throughout the whole world and throughout all of time. Right? You can be born and raised an American citizen or something else. But to be a Christian is to be a citizen of something bigger and better than America will ever be or could be. To be a citizen of a kingdom that extends throughout the whole world, throughout all of time. You know, we, we could say that every Christian is, in a sense, a global Christian. 
interested, burdened for the world as a whole. I mean, the Christian can say that our fellow Christians are brothers and sisters in the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, the implications are pretty simple. That means I have family in Malaysia. I've got kinfolk spiritually in Malaysia. How can I not be interested in what's happening with my family, my brothers and sisters in Malaysia? Of course I'm going to be interested in such things. The close connection. We go from being xenophobic, from being afraid of other people and types of people and so on, to being avidly interested in other people. Our egotism and egotistical outlook pops like a bubble under the influence of, of the gospel. God gives to us a commitment to obeying his command. We are soundly persuaded that this is indispensable and therefore precious to us as, as a people. This was true in, in the early church. This was very much the case in, in the early church. You think of the Jews, the most xenophobic people in the world, right? They look at all of the Gentiles out there as dogs. And the Lord's saying, no, man, these are your brothers and sisters. We've got to take the gospel to all these Gentiles. You're connected to them, these Jewish Christians. And, and they're, they're, they're mobilized, and their sights are reoriented, and everybody's looking to the horizon. How far can the light be taken? How far can the torch reach within our lifespan? And this is what's happened from generation to generation you know, a new generation arises and it takes, as it were, the torch from the previous generation and it looks out across the world and says, how far do we have yet to go? This is how much ground has been covered thus far. What's the next frontier? And where else does it need to go? And where do we need to pour our focus and prayers and energy and manpower and so on in taking the gospel? This is, the, this is the commitment that God's people have. And the New Testament scriptures exemplify it in vibrant color. Right? The book of Acts is about this spread in concentric circles of the gospel being taken further and further and further and further and further, especially there in, into the direction of, of Europe and so on, through Asia, into the European continent. And then we come to the New Testament epistles, and not all of them, but the vast majority of them are written to some of these budding, baby, Gentile churches, which have received the gospel with faith, and where congregations have been planted in little islands like Crete, and in big cities like Corinth, and Ephesus, and in places like Rome, where there's political uh, significance and, and stronghold. Little places and big places, out of the way places and in the mainstream places, all the gospel is being taken to all of these. And the church is in earnest so that they have, you know, Paul coming back and giving reports in Antioch, in Jerusalem, about what's happening. And there's letters being written to describe all of the way in which the work is progressing. There was a firm commitment in the New Testament scriptures to this great command. That brings us thirdly to the fact that it is a great commission, which is what we usually refer to this text as. It is a great commission. The church is being sent out. The church is being compelled. The church is being thrust into the vineyard. It's a commission from the king. The king has come and said, you have been given these orders these are your marching orders, up and at them, get to work. And we don't stop until the task is done, until the mission is complete. And the mission is only complete when the gospel has in fact reached all peoples and the Lord has gathered all of his elect people unto himself, after which the Lord himself will return. And not until then, he promises us. Remember, 
The Father made a promise, God the Father, to God the Son in Psalm 2, that he would give the Lord Jesus Christ the nations as his inheritance, the heathen as his heritage. That promise cannot be broken. It will not be broken. Likewise, in Psalm 110, we're told that the Son is to sit at the right hand of the Father until he makes all of his enemies his footstool. He's going to sit at the right hand of the majesty and high until all of his enemies are made his footstool. And not until then. And so it is a great, it is a great commission. What does that mean for us? It means as a church, we have a vision and a part to play in this work that the Lord has committed into our hands. So there's no getting out of it. The Lord has placed in our hands a task and we are swept up and included as participants in this. It's not as if, yeah, you know, some churches have missionaries and they maybe have a missionary come once a year and they hear something about missions and yeah, missions is part of the package out there somewhere. No, we, have, we are participants. We're not watching someone else do the Great Commission and hope that it gets on well. We ourselves are included as a part of it. And that means either we go or we support those who go. Those are the only options. There isn't an option of being a bystander or being a mere um, spectator. We either go, if God calls us to such, or we support those who go. But we, that is you, have a commission. You have a commission from the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you love the gospel? Do you love Christ's glory? Do you love the souls of men? If the answer is yes, then there is, you are left with nothing less than to be swept up into participating in this commission. You know, there have been... There have been objections raised from generation to generation to generation. At the end of the 18th century in Scotland, mod the moderates had begun to, to gain ground and the Bible-believing uh, reformed portion of the church had waned a bit. The liberal moderates had gained ground. And so the, when the topic of missions came up, they said, wow, this is, you know, We've got our own. We've got our own part of the vineyard. We're called to carry out the Great Commission in Scotland. That's it. What's needed out there in the world is for them to be civilized. So we need to, you know, they need to go out there and civilize them. And then after that happens, then they'll be prepared to receive the gospel and so on. You know, that idea persists to the present. And there's, there's the idea in a lot of people's minds that what we need to do is export America to the world. We need to export Western ways to the world. That if they had our, well, our ideas, I want to use very strong words to speak about how broken and ridiculous our ideas are, but our ideas of culture and social structure and political stuff and economy and so on, you know, sanitation and all of the other things, if we could just export these things to the world, then that would make a great d difference, and then they would be more receptive to the gospel and so on. And so you have, you have those who are very self-absorbed with their own comforts and their own uh, position and place in the world, let the rest of the world go on as it may, and if anything, we can throw money to ease our consciences or try to provide, you know, some other props uh, to keep them, keep them afloat. No, but it's the exact opposite in the Bible. We take them the gospel. That's what they need. They don't need Western ways. We're, we'll destroy them. You know, I went to, shortly after the wall fell, I went to Russia for five months in the early months of 1992. The wall hadn't been down very long. I'll tell you what, the, the, the church in Russia had very little interest. They were, they were abhorring the kind of Western influences that were pouring over uh, their border. It was 
not a happy thing for, for the church, and they were not impressed either with the kind of religion that American evangelicalism was bringing to these newly uh, liberated people. We had more to learn from them than they did from us. The point is, the gospel is what is needed, right? We have the beautiful example of John Patton, 19th century, sent to the, uh, to the uh, Vanuatu, New Hebrides, South Pacific, we use, we've used this illustration. I've done a historical address on him in the past, biographical address on him in the past. He goes there. They're cannibals. Right? The first missionaries that arrive there, they kill them and eat them. They're running around but naked. They're completely uncivilized by uh, our, our standards. He goes, takes the gospel. You know, within a short space, it's the gospel that changes people from the inside out. It does work its way to the outside. They didn't become Western, but you see the fruit of the gospel in the sense of you know, the Lord's day was kept and family worship's observed. They're clothed and there's order and structure to society and morality's been flourishing and all sorts of other things. The gospel is what God has promised to bless. You know, there are people who say, well, it's, it's nice to speak about the gospel, but there's a lot of hurting people out there. You know, we need to go out and eliminate, eliminate suffering. That's the thing we should focus on is eliminating suffering. The gospel is important too, but we need to eliminate, su eliminate suffering. Well, as best as I can tell, the greatest form of suffering that I know of is a person dwelling in conscious, eternal torment in hell. That seems to me to be the worst kind of suffering in all the world. If you want to eliminate suffering, then take the gospel to people. That's the kind of emphasis and priority that we need. God has called us uh, to this task. And that means that our prayers, for example, ought to be occupied with this matter. Our prayers ought to be occupied with this matter. It ought to be a priority. I was speaking on uh, Wednesday about the, the work of praying for the kingdom of, of the Lord uh, Jesus Christ. And this is one of the features that is so beautiful, I think. We have, as I said to the congregation on, at that time, you, you have people like the British hero Drake, who, you know, over the course of a couple of years, went around the whole world in his ship. Woohoo! Isn't this incredible? Wonderful. Brought back all sorts of cool stuff people had never seen before. The Christian can cover the entire world in prayer without ever leaving their home. We are able in our bedrooms or in our closets to, as it were, walk across the globe praying for the benefit of the gospel and the spread of the kingdom in these far reaches of, of the world. We are able to do far more good than Drake ever did in his span around the world. One of the things we find in our Westminster Directory for Public Worship, I read this Wednesday, in the prayer that is given before the sermon, it says, to pray for the propagation of the gospel and kingdom of Christ to all nations for the conversion of the Jews, the fullness of the Gentiles, the fall of Antichrist, the hastening of the second coming of our Lord, for the deliverance of the distressed churches abroad from the tyranny of the anti-Christian faction, that's Rome, and from the cruel oppressions and blasphemies of the Turk, for the blessing of God upon the reformed churches, especially upon the churches and kingdoms of Scotland, England, and Ireland, now more strictly and religiously united in the solemnly, solemn National League and Covenant and for our plantations, that's us, in the remote parts of the world, more particularly for that church and kingdom whereof we are members, that therein God would establish peace and truth, the purity of all of his ordinances, and the power of godliness, prevent and remove heresy, schism, profaneness, superstition, security, and unfruitfulness under the means of grace, heal all our rents and divisions, and preserve us from the breach of our solemn covenant. This is part of our Reformed heritage. We are to prioritize the prayer, praying for the kingdoms, the spread of the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ throughout the kingdoms of this world. The words of Revelation 
The kingdoms of this world shall be made the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. We're praying that the kingdoms of this world will be made the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ. That means that we need to know what, what's out there. We need to know, you know what's going on, what, what kind of mission work is taking place in various... We need to learn about countries. We need to learn about their needs. We need to learn what are the dominant religions, what's the opposition there, what kind of witness is being born, what are the needs in various places, and to get on our faces and plead with God for blessing upon these things. We want to see in foreign fields self-governing, self-propagating, self-supporting churches, which are working themselves, as we do in our country, for the spread of the gospel in their country. We can advance all of this by, by prayer. For those who say, well, now is not the proper time. This great commission says that the Lord will be with us always, to the ends of the earth that every time is the time that the Lord has called upon us to be busy. There are those who say, well, if we focus outside and look, you know, at the work of the gospel, whether it's in our own domestic scene or, or across the world, it will dampen fires locally. The fact that the, all of the facts prove the exact opposite that whenever there is great energy and emphasis that is poured into the work of Christ abroad, it is like a fire that spreads and the church at home flourishes more than it ever has. You look at the history of the church and it has always, always, always been the case. Rather than dampening the fire at home or reducing the resources at home, it multiplies it. Certainly true in the New Testament churches as well. There are those who say, well, look, we still, have, we still have lots of unconverted people here. Well, granted, I'm not saying we don't need churches here, obviously. Wherever there are people, we need churches. But the doctrine of election teaches us that God has more than just one people group that he intends to save, every kindred and tongue. And therefore, that gospel needs to be taken to the ends of the earth. The doctrine of election has always been an incentive to missions, never a deterrent to missions. And so you turn your face to the, to, to the New Testament, and what do we see? They hit the road. They were given this great commission. They received it from the Lord, and they got busy. Their horizon was set. Paul is t pressing he has a very brief window to live. He's going to take the gospel as far as possible before he dies. He makes it to Rome, but he tells us in the New Testament that he had his sights set on Spain. Beyond that, he was pushing and pressing to the end, not indulging himself in the comforts at, at home. You say, well, what about you know, a patriotic spirit? To be a Christian in 21st century America is to be patriotic. What a bunch of hogwash. We have an allegiance to our loyalty as Christ the King and to a kingdom that will never perish or die and which, whose borders extend far beyond the very limited borders that we are familiar with. Our chief loyalty is to that king and to that kingdom and to the spread of his glory and to the advance of his cause and worship. And therefore, our interest is every bit as much abroad as it is at home. As I said on Wednesday, the Psalms are full of this theme. Everywhere we turn in the Psalms, we're singing about the spread of the gospel, of the nations being brought to praise the Lord, of the nations being God's inheritance, and so on. Psalm 67 maybe being one of the great examples of that. And so, if nothing else, as a congregation, we are committed and have no choice but to advance the kingdom of God, first of all, by prayer. Self-conscious, disciplined, earnest, exercised prayer for the gospel being taken to the nations. It also means that we need to give all the support we can to such. 
And that means in giving out of our resources to those who are taking the gospel abroad. It means that we need to have a heightened interest in what's happening with our missionaries and getting to know what's happening with missionaries that we have yet been unfamiliar with, that we need to be seeking to supply strength and reinforcements and encouragement and whatever aid we can muster for that cause so that our daily life and our consciousness as a congregation includes this prevalent feature. How goes the mission? Always looking and longing for that gospel to be taken further and deeper and to more people until at last we are able to rest. And when we at last are able to rest, we sit down in heaven, it will be to sit down with those from different periods of time from ourself, different places in the earth from ourself, different languages than we had spoken ourselves, and with one heart and one mind and one mouth, worship and adore our great God. And so this, this commission is a command which we must obey and must never disobey It requires a great commitment on our part, self-conscious commitment, and it is a commission. We have something committed into our hands, and we must carry it forward by God's grace. May the Lord help us to that end. Let's stand for prayer. O Lord our God, we bless and praise your holy name. We acknowledge that you are a God abundant in grace. We delight, O Lord, in the commission that you've given to us. And we do have an earnest interest in the spread of your gospel and kingdom throughout the earth. Uh, Fortify and strengthen us as we seek to serve you and obedience and love. And as we seek to give ourselves uh, to participating in this commission and in giving you no rest until you make Jerusalem a praise in all the earth. Until you cause, O Lord, Uh, the work and spread of Zion to to go from sea to sea and shore to shore. And so we commend to you, O Lord, this, this work. Stir up our hearts in earnest prayer and in giving and in, in, in giving our strength as well as our resources uh, to your cause. And may it be to the spread of your fame. We ask for Jesus' sake. Amen. Psalm 69, verses 32 to 36. Psalm 69, 32 to 36, the tune is stored away, which is tune number 135. In verse 33, For God the poor hears, and will not his prisoners condemn Let heaven and earth and seas him praise, and all that move in them. For God will Judah's cities build, he will Zion save, that they may dwell therein, and it in sure possession have. And they that are his servant's seed inherit shall the same, so shall they have their dwelling there, that love his blessed name. Sing together verses 32 to the end.
Stand for the benediction. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all.